The floor is yours. Thank you, Massimiliano, and uh, welcome to Marco, who has just made it back from lunch in time to uh, join me in introducing our uh, collaborative work over a number of months, actually, now on uh, binary data serialization for data storage and sharing. And our focus is on geospatial data, but indeed the, the work could be widened out to uh, data in general. And this work was inspired by M Marco's work in, in many different areas the, in, in, in his GRC position. And we, we thought it was a nice opportunity to look at Phosphor-G tools and approaches to this very problem. Now, I think most of us who are attending a Phosphor-G conference will have some understanding about the practicalities of geo data exchange or data exchange in general. We have servers on the one side, we have client tools on the other. Servers are there to respond to requests and it can be sometimes a very complex job for a server to respond to a request because they might have high traffic network bandwidth which is uncontrollable sometimes. The query that they need to compute might be very complex. The client tools then, who are waiting for a response, must load, they must extract, maybe transform and then process these results. And of course client tools encounter problems such as delayed responses, uh, the problem of dealing with large amounts of data within, uh, within the client software environment. And XML, JSON, GeoJSON, CSV and shapefiles are probably, in our estimation anyway, the most popular responses uh, available through most APIs that are available today. So the research question that we set out to answer uh, over a year ago was this, could binary data serialization provide a realistic alternative to uh, data exchange in relation to those de facto standards such as XML or JSON. And we didn't really set out to do a, a bare bones time against space analysis of, uh, of binary versus JSON or XML, but rather we wanted to take a, a wider angled view of the problem to look at interoperability, to look at usability, scalability, and a focus on using open approaches, open source software, even indeed uh, open data, and of course, ease of use. Because as we'll conclude at the end of the presentation, one of the reasons why things like GeoJSON and JSON become de facto standards is because they're easy to use and enjoy huge uh, tool support. So we'd like to investigate conditions where binary serialization could replace or complement uh, those standards. And we, we chose two very popular binary uh, approaches, Google protocol buffers, which the OpenStreetMap people in the audience will be well familiar with uh, in, in recent years. And then if you've dabbled in Apache Hadhoop at all in, in your careers, uh, Apache Avro is the binary data serialization format used quite widely there. And that brings me on to that real world example is that OpenStreetMap has really set the pace here in, in our opinion of a large global data provider who is disseminating data in binary format, in a protocol buffer format. Now they do indeed provide shapefiles which are a binary format but if we think about shapefiles having a limitation in terms of some of the countries and regions in OpenStreetMap being so uh, data rich that the shapefile becomes unyieldy. OpenStreetMap makes the data available in PBF format. The example screenshotted here for Italy, for example. And what has happened over a number of years is that the community and the open source ecosystem has developed a number of tools around the fact that data is being delivered to the community and to anyone who needs it 
in PBF format. So we have the, the IMP OSM parser in Python, which I use a lot, and the Osmium library, which uh, if you've used OpenStreetMap PBF in, in any of the popular languages, you've probably encountered that library. So this shows where the old saying of, if you build it, they will come. If you make this data available in a consistent manner, in a reliable way, the community will respond uh, by building the tools needed uh, to, to work with that data. So to give an overview of our experimental setup, uh, we set up a workflow for three different experiments. And the three experiments tried to encapsulate the working conditions of an individual who is working with geospatial data in their daily set of tasks. So we are, we are picking out a person who is using a large static GIS data set, such as uh, the example we used here is from the National Land Survey of Finland and OpenStreetMap, where the data set was conflated to give a new data set of addresses with 1.9 million features. And that is available as a geo package of 300 megabytes in size. Now, for reproducibility reasons, we produced a very small, randomly generated little uh, relation of that data set with just 20,000 features uh, for, for 20 megabytes in size, also a geo package. Experiment two then was uh, an API, so a live API, which was an OGC sensor things API with 20,000 features. Now we just chose 20,000 because it's, it's nice to choose these rounded out figures, but you could query the API for, for any amount of uh, features you wished. The JSON response uh, yielded a file of 13 megabytes, or needed a response of 13 megabytes. And finally, uh, experiment three was another large static GIS data set, but this time it was polygons. It was the land cover data set for the Tuscany region, which we are enjoying at the moment. And that was a polygon data set with just over 160,000 uh, features in it. And we can see the data flow was to process the input data sets we convert them to GeoJSON, which I know looks like a redundant step, but to make everything equal, we convert it to GeoJSON. We then define the schemas, both the Avro schema and the PBF schema, and then we serialized to the binary data formats for Avro and PBF. And then to check everything worked, we de deserialized back to see if we got the same thing uh, at the end. And just some pictures because there's so many features, these are just red dots, but to show roughly geographically where our uh, data sets are coming from. The OGC sensors API is uh, some air, air traffic track, tracking data uh, focusing around some of the, the main airports in, in Germany. And uh, we, we have all our software available on, on GitHub. So if you want to take a look at that. We've, we've tried to make the code as reproducible as possible, and we've tried to use no hacks. So I had to follow my lead on what I tell my students to comment your code well and do nothing strange in the software and make it as interoperable as possible. One of the manual steps was to actually create the Avro and Protobuf, Protobuf schemas. So if you're familiar with Protobuffer, what you need to do is to download the compiler from, from Google so that you set up the schema and then use the compiler to generate the class uh, of your choice. So in my case, this was a, a Python class. So it very, very quickly and easily generates uh, some Python code, which you don't need to uh, touch at all. The Avro schema, on the other hand, is simply just a matter of following a JSON a data structure which corresponds to your data model in the original file. So looking at the results, and I realized tables are difficult to find, uh, to zone in on when you're looking at a presentation. So in yellow here, I've tried to summarize what the key message from each of these experiments uh, was. And what we found here was obviously with a very large file, uh, 
serialization took a long time. And the difference in the GeoJSON files here between serialization and deserialization was around the precision of the coordinates, because we found the, the Python libraries that we used would only allow uh, 10 decimal places, where the original file gave us 15. So I'm not sure what you need precision of 15 uh, decimal places for, but obviously if you just look at characters in an ASCII file, you can see how you would have a reduction there. But the binary files then, as a result, are over 20% uh, smaller. And that's a, a, a key, key uh, message for us there. In experiment two for the Sensor Things API, we thought these were very positive results because the binary files now were approaching 50% uh, smaller with serialization being very fast, given that I have a very slow laptop. These are quite good times, uh, I believe. The, the deserialization is actually 3.5 3 times slower, and this probably needs some more investigation and maybe a more efficient implementation than I actually uh, wrote myself. The final uh, experiment for the polygons uh, from the Tuscany region was very interesting, and it was something that uh, arose in a talk I chaired earlier today about vector, vector tiles and... Uh, GeoJSON, we actually removed some attributes or properties from the original data set because we found that the original data set was carrying properties that were non-changing over a large number of years. And this obviously has an effect of reducing the size of the original uh, data set. So this is what we call the reduced uh, JSON file. And we also found this issue again, where the coordinates were originally expressed as 15 decimal places, but Python GeoJSON only allows us to work with 10. So we didn't try to hack that, we just allowed that to, uh, to work through. And the, the Avro and PBF files, again, as expected, are, are smaller than the reduced uh, properties file. So just coming towards the end, some technical considerations, and we, we have a, a number of publications that you can read more details on. So I'm just picking out some of the higher level details here. But the, the binary files as expected and happily uh, confirmed by our experimental analysis were at least 20% smaller than the GeoJSON. Now, de deserialization was always slower than serialization, but that needs further investigation because I am not the world's best developer. So it may be a case that a, a better programmer will generate a better solution. But that actually brings about an important issue that if you have to be a very, very experienced developer to gain those performance uh, increases, maybe that is a disadvantage of the, the approach. Binary data files, as you may know, lack basic query capabilities. So if you want to find uh, the number of restaurants in an OpenStreetMap uh, PBF file, you cannot just open it and do a query. You must use a tool or you must use uh, your own software code. So GeoJSON obviously has that ability. Uh, and there is a need if your application requires basic query capabilities and you don't want to write an, an additional tool, you will probably have to serialize back to, uh, to GeoJSON. And then data model considerations. We've seen an issue around precision. So I remember Mike Goodchild always encouraging people to think about precision. Seven decimal places, I think he said, was, was plenty. So why we need 15? Uh, maybe we're going down to subatomic level at that point. Uh, Inclusion of redundant attributes. Does your data set need to carry attributes that are not required or properties that are not required? So we teach students this in a database class for redundancy in their data model. And those things must be considered carefully in the, in the future. So the final uh, slide from a practical point of view, there are many positive results here, but there's a number of overheads. So firstly, in the experimental setup that Marco and I worked with, there's, there's non-automated schema generation. So we actually have to sit down, work out the original data model, then work out the schema, and then generate the classes or the, the, the schema file. 
you do need specialist programmer knowledge, as I've, as I've emphasized. There is user community support for binary data serialization, but it is much smaller than the huge community that are there available to answer questions on JSON or, or GeoJSON serialization. Indeed, binary data serialization could work very, very well for Pacific scenarios. So we've seen this in, in OpenStreetMap. But a lot of factors must uh, converge to make that a real possibility. And one of the main outcomes of this work is that it still remains a challenge to measure and understand what success means in terms of replacing well-established well used and understood de facto standards with something new. Now, binary data serialization is, is not new. The meteorological community have been using this for many decades, but it is in a way new to the GIS or the geospatial data community because it does require some extra tools that are not always immediately available. So just to finish some future work, and we always uh, welcome collaboration uh, Marco and I, that there is opportunity for further computational uh, experiment, experimental work on this, on different types of geodata and indeed on different types of services. I think doing a more deep dive analysis on services based, in, uh, based out there on the internet rather than just on local host or on our own machines uh, is, is very important. And making binary data approaches user-friendly uh, you know, the moment you start talking about creating schemas and generating class files just to convert a file from one format to another, people are a little bit disappointed. So more integrated tool support. So maybe we, we look forward to the day that a PBF file can just be opened up in, uh, in any, any tool of your choice. And of course, there's huge opportunity with the linked geodata community potentially around automated semantic interoperability. So that ability to automatically generate our schemas and that they would be automatically updated uh, because of embedding it within the, the linked geodata environment. We've two publications. Again, they're uh, available. You'll find the links on, on GitHub, but you'll, you'll find the, the QR codes there and in our paper. And it's been my pleasure to work with Marco and the, the JRC team, and indeed many other experts uh, in the last couple of months around a set of projects on data-driven uh, innovation in Europe. And thank you everyone for listening, and uh, I look forward to your questions.